So Dr. Thomas Fitzpatrick, who's really the father of all dermatology, devised the Fitzpatrick scale many years ago for patients undergoing phototherapy. And his real aim was to determine who burned and who tanned on exposure to ultraviolet light. So patients with psoriasis, for example, receiving ultraviolet therapy, we could predict based on a questionnaire they filled out whether they would burn or tan, and that would help guide the dosage used. That was Dr. Susan Taylor, and this is Dermatology Weekly. Welcome to episode 55 of Dermatology Weekly, where we bring you the latest in dermatology news, followed by a peer-to-peer conversation with clinical and research experts in the field of dermatology. I'm the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews. Coming up later, Dr. Susan Taylor, along with Olivia Ware and Jessica Dawson, join Dr. Vincent DeLeo on peer-to-peer to discuss Fitzpatrick's skin type and racial limitations in clinical practice. All of us here at MD Edge Medscape understand the current climate of healthcare amid COVID-19. We are covering the outbreak with our full editorial capacity, including how the pandemic impacts dermatology. More on that later. You can find all of our COVID coverage at mdedge.com or medscape.com. And now, the latest in dermatology news. We begin with how COVID-19 has impacted dermatology and the steps that dermatologists can take. Indeed, the novel coronavirus presents a severe challenge to global healthcare, and its impact is felt far beyond the ED to many specialties, including dermatology. A new report published in the British Journal of Dermatology notes that dermatologists in the Chinese province of Wuhan outlines initial experiences and provides a blueprint for triaging potential cases before they reach the derm clinic. In the report, Jean Tao of Haozong University of Science and Technology writes that the hospital triages all patients at the entrance and that those who are suspected of having the virus are sent to a designated department, while those who have a skin condition who are not suspected of being infected are allowed to go to a dermatology triage center. At the dermatology triage center, they are once again examined. The dermatology patients pass examination. They'll be cleared for the derm clinic. The authors of the report also covered hospitalized patients with primary or secondary skin conditions. A dermatologist is on site at the dermatology triage station to conduct in-depth assessments if they're needed. If a patient has a fever that is believed to be caused by a dermatologic condition, the on-site dermatologist assists in the consult. Because some patients may only become symptomatic after admission to a ward, the authors recommend hospitals have a COVID-19 trained contingency group on hand to prevent and control outbreaks within that institution. The team should be in communication with respiratory intensive care and radiology departments to exclude the virus when cases develop in the hospital. When a hospitalized infected patient has a skin condition requiring treatment, the authors recommend that pictures be sent to the dermatologist for evaluation, along with teleconferences to further assess. The dermatologist should go to the patient's bedside if necessary with as much information as possible related in advance in order to minimize bedside exposure. Further, Dr. Town told MD Edge that he thinks that skin lesions are associated with dermatologic conditions could lead to increased risk of COVID-19. He said that theoretically, the virus could lead to infection through contact with subcutaneous tissues, mucosal services, or blood vessels. However, Dr. Adam Friedman, who is a professor at George Washington University, doubts that this kind of transmission would even occur since the virus doesn't infect keratinocytes. He is also concerned that this kind of suggestion can add to the stigma that dermatology patients already experience. A critical aspect of dermatology is the immunosuppressive agents often used in dermatology patients. Such drugs could make them more susceptible to infections or to worse outcomes in the event of disease. Dr. Friedman recently sent a patient a letter in which he wrote he thinks that these kind of drugs are something to consider for at-risk individuals. While most focus in lay media is on the elderly, there is a large population of individuals on medications that lower their immune system who are going to be at risk for more severe infection. Dr. Friedman suggested to that patient that he or she should begin working remotely. And our next story, patients are accepting artificial intelligence in skin cancer screening. In a small survey, 75% of dermatology patients said they would recommend the use of AI for skin cancer screening to friends and family. However, 94% of these responders emphasized the need for symbiosis between doctors, patients, and of course, AI. 
This is according to a new study published in JAMA Dermatology in which researchers identified 48 patients who were seen between May and July in 2019 at general dermatology clinics. In the cohort, 16 patients had a history of melanoma, 16 with a history of non-melanoma skin cancer, and 16 with no history of cancer. Average patient age was just over 53 years, and about half were women. Nearly all patients, 94%, were white. The researchers interviewed 24 patients about a direct-to-patient AI tool, and 24 patients were interviewed about a clinician decision tool. Overall, the researchers report that 36 patients said they would recommend the AI tool to family and friends. That includes 17 patients in the direct-to-patient group and 19 patients in the physician AI group. Nine patients said they were ambivalent about the tools, and three said they would not recommend either AI tool. The most common perceived benefits of AI were speed and access to health care. The most commonly reported perceived risk was patient anxiety. Additionally, 69% of patients perceived more accurate diagnosis to be the greatest strength of AI. However, 85% of patients said that less accurate diagnoses was the biggest AI risk. University of Pennsylvania physician Dr. Kerry Koberic said that although AI technology has not been widely implemented in dermatology, it is the pivotal time to assess patients' views on the subject to understand their knowledge base, as well as values, preferences, and concerns regarding artificial intelligence. And finally today, dermatologists appear to be the best at finding work satisfaction in the office among all healthcare professionals. This is according to Medscape's 2020 Lifestyle, Happiness, and Burnout Report. You can read the full report by clicking the link in the show notes. In the report, about 41% of dermatologists said they were very happy at work. That makes dermatology the only specialty survey to break 40% in the survey. Rheumatologists were the happiest outside of work, followed closely behind by dermatologists. Unsurprisingly, the percentage of dermatologists who reported being burned out was lower than overall burnout rates among physicians, which was 41%. The burnout rate among dermatologists was 36%. The biggest factors for dermatologist burnout were bureaucratic tasks, EHR time, and government compliance. No dermatologists in the survey reported having attempted suicide, but 16% of responders reported having contemplated suicide. And that's the news in dermatology. Episode 55 of Dermatology Weekly will be right back with our peer to peer conversation and Dr. Vincent DeLeo. Welcome back to episode 55 of Dermatology Weekly. I am Nick Andrews. It's time now for Peer to Peer. Please welcome Dr. Vincent DeLeo. This year, CUTIS is celebrating 55 years of serving the dermatology community. Back in February 1965, when CUTIS was launched, my predecessor's vision was to bring readers, and I quote, in simple and concise form, the latest in diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment with articles dealing with common dermatoses or those rarer diseases of great interest. We are still working toward this mission 55 years later. To our loyal readers, contributors, and editorial board members, thank you for continuing to turn to CUTIS for the latest in diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. To our new readers, we hope you find our articles in simple and concise form relevant to your practice. And to our resident readers, you are entering one of the most rewarding specialties in medicine, dermatology. Continue to read CUTIS in print and access CUTIS content online at MD Edge Dermatology. Today we're speaking with Dr. Susan Taylor and her colleagues, Olivia Ware and Jessica Dawson, about the racial limitations of Fitzpatrick skin type. Thank you all for joining us today. Can you please introduce yourselves for our listeners? Yes, my name is Dr. Susan Taylor. I'm an associate professor of dermatology at the Perlman School of Medicine of the University of Pennsylvania. My name is Olivia Ware. I'm a fourth-year medical student at Howard University in Washington, D.C. And my name is Jessica Dawson, and I'm also a fourth-year medical student at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle. Great. So let's get started. 
what was the Fitzpatrick skin type classification aiming to do in its early stages? So Dr. Thomas Fitzpatrick, who's really the father of all dermatology, devised the Fitzpatrick scale many years ago for patients undergoing phototherapy. And his real aim was to determine who burned and who tanned on exposure to ultraviolet light. So patients with psoriasis, for example, receiving ultraviolet therapy, we could predict based on a questionnaire they filled out whether they would burn or tan, and that would help guide the dosage used. What's particularly important to note was that the Fitzpatrick skin type system only had skin types 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, and 6 were added later. 6 was supposed to cover all people who were black, and five and four, those with lighter skin tones. So how did we get from that to using that scale for categorizing skin color? So it most likely occurred because there hasn't been another widely adopted classification system for describing skin color that can be applied to all skin. While not its intended purpose, the Fitzpatrick skin types are associated with visual stereotypical skin color cues, as Dr. Taylor mentioned. So as medical students, Olivia and I noticed in our various dermatology rotations and clinical situations that our attendings would ask us after seeing the patient first, so what's their skin type? It posed this question in our minds from our attending, so are you asking about the patient's propensity to burn, or are you asking about their constitutive skin color to get an idea of what this patient looks like before seeing them? Almost always it was to determine their constitutive skin color, because when a formal assessment of Fitzpatrick skin type, that required more of a follow-up questions about their ability to tan and burn when exposed to sunlight. So we also noticed that the FST was automatically put into the physical exam portion of different standardized note templates, even for patients without phototherapy needs. So we really wanted to explore this phenomenon to see how do providers actually use FST to describe skin color on a larger scale. So that was the purpose of your investigation. So can you tell us about the methodology of your survey to evaluate how providers use the FST in their clinical practice? So we conducted an anonymous survey of how dermatologists and dermatology trainings use FST types in their practice, and the survey was distributed electronically through the Association of Professors of Dermatology, Listserv, as well as in person at the 2019 Skin of Color Society meeting in Washington, D.C. So our survey, it was eight items, and it included questions about demographics, such as practice setting, board certification, and geographic location, whether the respondent identified as an individual with skin of color, and then also how did the respondent use FST in their clinical practice, such as for describing race and ethnicity, skin cancer risk, constitutive baseline skin color, determining phototherapy dosage, suitability for laser treatments, and the likelihood for skin burning. And then eventually we used a T-test to determine whether dermatologists who identified as having skin of color used FST differently. Okay, so sounds like an interesting methodology. What did you find? How are providers using Fitzpatrick skin type? So we ended up including about 140 overall respondents. It was a combo of both board-certified dermatologists and dermatology trainees. Like Jess said, we had about 70% had board certification and 30% with who were still residents. Uh, We found that 92% of respondents have an academic affiliation primarily, which we thought was really important considering that they are the people that are teaching medical students or residents how you use practice typing. We found that 26% of respondents self-identified as having skin of color, likely because we conducted part of the survey at the Skin of Color Society, felt like we had a really good representation, and then ended up finding that 41% of all respondents agreed that FST should be used in their clinical documentation. But to the scenario that Jess mentioned, 
when do you use Fitzpatrick typing for patients race or ethnicity? 31% said that they use Fitzpatrick skin type and 47% said that they use it for describing constitutive skin color with 22% actually saying that they would use it in both scenarios. So whether or not it's constitutive skin color or to describe race and ethnicity, those are actually both inappropriate means of using Fitzpatrick skin type. So in total, anywhere from a third to a half of all the providers that we surveyed were actually using Fitzpatrick skin type incorrectly. And we found that respondents who did not identify as having skin of color were more likely to use FST to describe constitutive skin color. Um, and near statistical significance didn't quite reach that, but was certainly an important finding. We also kind of anecdotally asked how providers use Fitzpatrick type if it wasn't in one of the options that we had listed. And people used it for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation to talk about a patient's propensity to have melasma, how they would respond to cryotherapy. So there was really a whole range of kind of how Fitzpatrick type is using. And again, we want to emphasize that this is coming from clinicians who are in academic institutions and training residents and medical students on how to use Fitzpatrick typing. That's a really good synopsis of the findings in your study. Can you now briefly discuss other classification systems for assessment of skin type that our listeners should be aware of? I'd be happy to. Um, So there's a whole range of classification systems, and I think Part of the reason that many of these were developed is there's not a good overall scale for how you can talk about skin color. We have a whole table that lists various types of skin types, and when you're looking at them, kind of the first way that you want to think about it is how are we looking at skin color. So half of the um, classification systems out there are self-reported, and they're either self-reported by a questionnaire that you ask a patient. So for example, what's your propensity to burn? How do you respond to sunlight? or they're a self-reported questionnaire where you're asking things like family history and trying to get a more detailed ancestry of the patient. A perfect example is the Willis and Ehrlich scale, the self-reported scale that uses African descent to classify skin color, UV light reaction, associated pigmentary disorders, and that's in comparison to, say, the Fitzpatrick type, where you can ask a patient about their propensity to burn There's also a modified Fitzpatrick skin type. We found a study out of India that actually changed the way that they asked the questions of patients because there's no role for a tanning bed or a tanning booth in their society, and those questions were kind of lost in translation, you could say. So changing the questions to be things like, how do you feel when you burn? Is it painful? Does it tingle? Actually got at a more accurate version of the Fitzpatrick skin type. There's also the Taylor hypopigmentation scale, which I believe Dr. Taylor is going to talk about in just a bit, so I won't go over that. And then there's a whole other set of scales that people use for cosmetic purposes. Some of it overlaps with a phototherapy type propensity, but other stuff is how you respond to laser hair removal or various cosmetic procedures. And I think kind of the resounding point is that none of these are perfect, and they all are trying to get at various different aspects, kind of the same issue. And part of educating ourselves as dermatologists is to make sure that we are aware of the scales and when to use them. And that includes the batch type being the most commonly used scale. Great. So now, Dr. Taylor, can you tell us about your hyperpigmentation scale? So as was just pointed out, most dermatologists use the Fitzpatrick skin type scale as a proxy for constitutive color, skin color. And what I was attempting to do many years ago was to create a system where you could actually look at different shades of tan and brown and yellow and use that as a guide to selecting the skin hue of the individual person. So that way, we're removing the FST from predicting constitutive color to actually having a representative of the color. Gotcha. Now, what what would be a limitation, though, of using constitutive skin color in clinical practice? Well, one limitation is that it will not predict burning or tanning, for example, but it could help one be able to track 
improvement in hyperpigmentation or hypopigmentation, for example. So I think part of the challenge, and this is actually really nicely represented by the Brazilian artist Angelica Das, in a project that she did using different Pantone paint swatches, where she tried to represent all of the shades of skin color that she sees basically in the population and found that it's basically infinite, that it is really challenging to come up with a system that describes each person's skin tone, if there's a red, a yellow, a pink undertone, in addition to what their actual constitutive skin color looks like um, on various aspects of the body. And it was really nicely represented in her work, and it's probably why this has been so challenging for dermatologists over the last few decades and why we have so many different systems for trying to describe skin color, um, that it's not an easy answer. Many years ago, we convened a group from an international group of dermatologists to try to come up with an alternative to the Fitzpatrick skin type system to be able to predict burning or tanning or laser response to lasers, for example, or chemical peels and to grade hyperpigmentation. And we were there for an entire weekend, people from South America, Asia, Europe, and we could not come up with a system. So what's next? Where are we going in the future with describing skin color? So I think that we need to be just a little bit more aware of how we are using FST in clinical practice to describe constitutive skin color while it's not its original intended purpose. And then also we really do need some other different classification system to describe constitutive skin color in a way that really appreciates the rich diversity of different skin hues. But we do recognize that there's definitely many challenges involved, but we're optimistic that a classification system can be created that will do more justice to describing that rich diversity. Well, thank you all for being with us today and giving us an interesting discussion of an important topic. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Dr. DeLeo, thank you very much for providing this important forum uh, for this discussion. The world is becoming so diverse and there's so many different hues, races, ethnicities. And as dermatologists on the forefront, we need to be able to uh, identify uh, pigmentary disorders, identify who will have adverse reactions to a variety of procedures. And uh, thinking about how to do that is really the first step in accomplishing that goal. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. DeLeo, for letting us be on this podcast. I also just wanted to take a moment to thank my mentors, uh, Dr. Taylor, who's on this call, as well as Dr. Michi Shinohara from the University of Washington School of Medicine, who has been really influential on our creation of the survey and supporting us through the research that Olivia and I have put together. Uh, you're quite welcome. I thought it was an interesting discussion, and I actually saw the artwork that you described uh, of Brazilian population and skin colors. And if any of our listeners get a chance to visit an exhibition by Angelica Das, uh, I would suggest they do that. It's really enlightening. So thank you all very much for discussing this issue with us today. Thanks. And that concludes episode 55 of Dermatology Weekly. Let's get to this week's credits. Dermatology Weekly is produced by MD Edge editors Elizabeth Meshkati and Melissa Sears. The peer-to-peer portion of the show is produced by Melissa Sears and Tyler Mundek. It's hosted by Dr. Vincent DeLeo. Our guests this week were Dr. Susan Taylor and Olivia Ware and Jessica Dawson. The news portion of Derm Weekly is produced by Elizabeth Meshkati and written by myself, Nick Andrews. Stories were originally published online at mdedge.com and were written by Jim Kling, Heidi Spleet, and Lucas Frankie. All MDEdge podcasts are produced by MDEdge and Medscape Editor-in-Chief Dr. Ivan Oransky, along with Executive Editors Kathy Scarbeck and Mary Ellen Schneider, and Multimedia Editor Terry Rudd. Social Media is produced by Kyla Clark. Dermatology Weekly is produced, edited, and engineered by Tyler Mundek. For all of us here at MDEdge, I'm Nick Andrews. 
You're listening to Dermatology Weekly.